I would like to call this meeting to order and welcome everybody physically present here and those following us virtually to this uh, very brief but highly important dialogue on the human rights implications of the COVID-19 pandemic to the rights of the vulnerable persons in Uganda, which has been organized jointly by the Swedish Embassy and the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We welcome you, the Acting Chairperson, Uganda Human Rights Commission, and uh, the Swedish Ambassador to Uganda. We also recognize the presence of the country rep, UN Human Rights in Uganda. Our distinguished panelists, Mr. James Ebitu, from the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development, and also Madame Naso Zikiaga, uh, uh, the Executive Director, DefLink Uganda, my colleague Ruth Sekindi, Director Monitoring and, um, Monitoring and Inspections from the Uganda Human Rights Commission. This is how we are going to proceed. We will have remarks from the Acting Chairperson, Uganda Human Rights Commission. We will also have remarks from His Excellency the Ambassador. Then thereafter, I will invite our distinguished panelists who will make uh, brief presentations, which will be followed by a plenary discussion where those who are here physically and those who are following us online will have a chance to make a contribution to this discussion. Without any further delay, I would like to invite the acting chairperson, Uganda Human Rights Commission, to come and make his remarks. You are most welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Kamadi. Your Excellency, the Swedish Ambassador to Uganda, the representative of the UN Human Rights in Kampala, distinguished guests who are here, representatives of government who are here, development partners, members of Uganda Human Rights Commission, representatives of the media fraternity, ladies and gentlemen. I feel maybe I should take off for a minute this. I feel greatly honored and very pleased to officiate at this function the function of, which is a virtual dialogue on human rights for vulnerable groups in Uganda and their access to justice during the COVID-19 pandemic. As you will recall, in January 2020, the World Health Organization confirmed the outbreak of coronavirus disease known as COVID-19 which was later declared a global pandemic. In March 2020, the first case of COVID-19 in Uganda was registered, unfortunately. Following the confirmation of COVID cases in Uganda, the government of Uganda started a series of lockdown measures to curb the spread of the virus. This was followed by suspension of public transport, a mandatory curfew uh, observed from 7 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. every day, and eventually suspension of private transport as well as much of public office activities and business activities. While the lockdown measures were important for curbing the spread of the deadly COVID-19 pandemic, 
They were, however, not without consequences to the many people whose activities for earning livelihoods were affected. Many individual, individuals, households, businesses experienced several economic challenges. Among these challenges were those faced by various vulnerable groups of people who were affected by the lockdown measures. In fulfillment of its constitutional mandate, our commission, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, has been actively involved in monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on the enjoyment of human rights in this country. This has been done through monitoring visits that we have carried out uh, to health facilities, refugee settlements, places of detention, and such other places. The Commission has also advised government through written advisories, which include the advisory on the hybrid digital general elections in the context of COVID-19, the advisory on places of detention again in the context of COVID-19, the advisory on education also in the context of COVID-19, and the advisory on health. In order to reach the public, the Commission has also made various engagements with the key government institutions and also held radio and TV talk shows and civic education um, activities. The Commission has, however, all along noted with concern the vulnerable person, that the vulnerable persons have continued to face serious challenges, including children in particular, including children in particular who have faced serious problems which include teenage pregnancies, early marriage, and domestic violence, while other groups like women, persons with disabilities, older persons and persons living with HIV AIDS have continued to face challenges in accessing medical services, information, food, and other basic necessities. While those suspect, the people suspected of having contact, contracted COVID-19 have faced the problem of stigmatization within the communities where they live. The Commission, however, welcomes the directives that were made by His Excellency the President to enable pregnant women access antenatal services without serious hindrance or much difficulty and for those due for delivery to be taken to medical facilities with minimal inconveniences. The Commission has further noted that persons with disabilities have often been dis dis disproportionately subjected to various um, forms of violence and abuse. Many of them have become victims of physical, sexual, psychological, and emotional abuse, as well as neglect and financial exploitation. Violence against persons with disabilities has often occurred within the context of systematic discrimination against them which is characterized by imbalance of power. 
the social conditions and barriers they face, such as stigma, dependency on other people for care, gender inequalities, poverty and financial dependency, have made these people most vulnerable during the lockdown. Many of them have lost their jobs and other sources of income which would have assisted them to sustain their livelihoods. Even after the lockdown was eased or lifted in some areas, vulnerable persons continue, still continue to face various challenges due to high costs of transport, for example, high costs of food, and other basic necessities. Access to justice for such a people has also been limited during the lockdown. Our commission has particularly noted that court sessions were reduced during the lockdown with only the chief magistrate's courts working in the magistrate, magisterial areas on selected days only. As a result of this, many suspects had to wait in police custody for many days before the magistrates could attend to their matters. And this inevitably resulted in congestion in police cells. Many of the detained persons did not have access to legal representation, again due to restrict, restricted movements. The commission offices continue to receive complaints using the toll-free lines, which are available throughout our 10 regional offices and 12 field offices scattered in the country. Most of the complaints received have been mainly about child neglect, domestic violence, and limited access to health care services. Therefore, as I conclude my statement, it is my hope that as stakeholders, for those of, for, for us who are here, we are reminded our international obligations, the obligations that require us to ensure effective protection of vulnerable persons and to address the various barriers that prevent such a people from enjoying their rights. The COVID-19 pandemic has clearly highlighted these challenges and it is therefore our responsibility as duty bearers to ensure that all vulnerable groups, the rights of all vulnerable people are pro promoted and protected. This dialogue, therefore, should provide us with an invaluable opportunity to exchange views on how we can play our respective roles more effectively in this respect. With these few remarks, I now have the pleasure to suggest that this meeting proceeds with official blessing from the Uganda Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Chairman, I've been advised that uh, His Excellency the Ambassador will speak at the end. Um, we will now go straight away uh, to hear from our, a panel of our distinguished experts. And uh, we will begin with Madame Nasoz Kiaga. Madame Nasoz Kiaga is the founder and executive director of Deaf Link Uganda which is a non-government organization which was established in 2007 to work with deaf and hard of hearing people. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in education from Makere University 
She also studied English literature at the University of Cambridge and later qualified as a communicator and support worker with the deaf at Red Bridge College in the United Kingdom. She also has worked with Sense Southeast and Deaf Blind UK in England as a support worker with deaf blind adults and as a technical advisor on deaf education and community uh, of practice, inclusive education with Christian Blind Mission. She, her CV may take uh, the entire time allocated to us here, but um, I would like to say she's uh, uh, a very dedicated person when it comes to matters of vulnerable persons, highly experienced, and uh, she's here to share with us her wealth of experience, what she has observed, and what needs to be done, because the COVID pandemic is still with us, and the challenges are many. Madam Nasozi, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here at this session. I would like to talk about personal experiences of persons with disabilities with key examples from deaf people that I serve. This year, 2020, will be remembered as a year never before especially as we continue to battle this crisis, this deadly pandemic. In the midst of this pandemic, we have persons with disabilities. We must recognize that the vulnerability of persons with disabilities has been heightened by this pandemic. However, there are a few aspects that I would like us to note during this discussion. There are categories of disabilities that we must be aware of. Physical, sensory, intellectual, learning, and mental health disabilities. Each of these disabilities in degrees of intensity poses unique challenges of which Many are complex and diverse. However, we have to note that persons with disabilities at most times also have pre-existing health conditions which make them highly susceptible to infections, especially this coronavirus. Two, the lives of persons with disabilities are characterized by experiences of discrimination, deprivation, and chronic poverty. These are factors, as we know in our society, that are fueled by negative connotations and negative associations to causes of disabilities, which relegate persons with disability to a low social status, making them discriminated against in all forms of our lives. Therefore, the human rights of persons with disabilities in this context continue to be abused. They continue to be exposed to so many different types of injustices, violence, exploitation, harassment, and isolation. Denied the rights to life opportunities, many are facing, even to date, enormous barriers that prevent them from leading dignified lives as human beings. This special category of people is the subject of our discussion. The impact of COVID-19 on their lives is very heartbreaking. This is a matter close to my heart because I grew up with a hearing loss. Therefore, experiences and understanding of issues of disabilities are very profound to me. One of the challenges 
that I will share regards language and communication. We all know that people who are deaf use a different type of language, sign language. There are so many deaf people at the same time who have no language at all because sign language is only learned in school. It means that 80% of deaf children who are out of school have no language whatsoever. However, the language and the forms of media that were used to disseminate information about the coronavirus were totally inaccept and inaccessible for people who are deaf. And what happened, because many did not hear the announcements, they became victims of police brutality. Many of our security forces used excessive force in ensuring that lockdown measures were followed. But what about people who do not hear? So I share with you a brief example of one man. He was going to work, a carpenter. And on his way, he was not aware, he did not hear the announcement of lockdown. His wife, who is also deaf, was pregnant, seven months pregnant with their first child. When Baluku was on his way back home, there was chaos everywhere in town. And before he knew it, an officer pounced on him, put him on the ground, and assaulted him. Baluku did not know what was going on. His arm, in the, in the issuing violence, his arm was broken, but he did not realize until he reached home. Reaching home very late at night, the family realized he was bleeding. Now, this is a deaf man, a carpenter. His life seized at that moment. He could not work because his arm, arm was broken. He could not communicate because his arm was broken. Another deaf man explained that on his way to work, he was arrested by the police around Kabalaga. They arrested him, put him in a cell. He tried to explain that he was deaf. No one listened. He spent in Kabalagala police station over six hours. And to release him and his car, the police forced him to pay a bribe for him to go. Deafness is invisible. Until you begin to communicate with someone, you cannot realize that they are deaf. These are issues that we must be very sensitive about when we are dealing with persons with disabilities. The second item regarding language and communication that many people with disabilities have faced, even to date, is the dissemination of information on the coronavirus. This information continues to be inaccessible because we all know that majority of persons with disabilities are ir illiterate. They cannot access print media, they cannot read it. Many cannot even listen to, they cannot hear. Those who are deaf cannot hear the radio. Those who are blind cannot see the television. Many cannot use social media platforms. All of these media channels for many persons continue to be inaccessible. So at the ease of lockdown, when we sat down with members of staff from DefLink Uganda. This is the first issue we recognized. So we wrote a proposal to the Minister of Health about this problem. Personally, I made contact through the scientific advisory committee set up to advise the Minister of Health on issues on coronavirus. I met one of the doctors who was in a panel. This was a panel of 17 scientists who provided constant information to the Minister of Health. I will read to you a sentence to open up the abstract that we wrote to the Minister. Deaf people comprise a linguistic minority that is commonly marginalized in mainstream health programs. Subsequently, the threat posed by the deadly coronavirus heightens deaf people's exposure to infection, which is further compounded by language and communication barriers. Health information in its present form by the Ministry of Health is not reaching deaf communities 
and many persons with disabilities. I submitted this proposal in June. Later on, I received a response via email, which I also want to share with you. And it read, Dear Nasozi, as promised, we have severally raised the issue that you put on our tables in meetings of the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Minister of Health. Several of us spoke passionately about the cause in these meetings. The last time we discussed those issues, the Minister of Health asked for your telephone contact, which we shared with her. That is the far we can go, and that is the far we have gone. As members of the advisory committee, that is what we promised. I waited for the minister's contact call regarding this matter. To date, I am still waiting. Lockdown restrictions. Although lockdown precautionary measures to curb the spread of the coronavirus were great because they helped our country protect itself against infection. But these had devastating consequences on the lives of persons with disabilities. Many persons with disabilities, as you know, a lot of them, if you look around us in our streets, live rough on the streets of Kampala and many cities. Many live as beggars for survival. And we often wonder, at the time of lockdown, did anyone follow up where these people went? And at the time of easing of lockdown, did anyone bother? Did anyone try to find out what were their personal experiences? And if not, who should be responsible for these people? One of the biggest problems that we had and we experienced that deaf people came forth was the increased violence within homes because of lockdown. Movement restrictions meant that children and persons with disabilities were locked in homes with their tormentors. Many of these children experienced violence within their homes and communities. I give a short example of a woman in Chegegua who is deaf. She cannot communicate. She doesn't use sign language. I had to rely on another deaf person to explain that her husband, who was a laborer on a farm, lost his job. And because of the constant, constant requirements within the home, a family which was living under immense poverty, the man turned on his wife, hit him constantly. There was constant violence within the home until the woman ran away. This aggression especially we have seen amongst females with disabilities. Many were subjected to sexual violence, harassment, physical and emotional abuse within their homes. Domestic violence during the time of lockdown went high. Even amongst couples with disabilities, these were sparked by issues of unemployment because many lost their jobs. The rising needs within the home that couldn't be met. The in immense frustration in being locked down in a situation that none of us could control. One of the key items of people who are deaf is that they thrive on physical interaction because their language is so unique. We must realize that 80% of deaf children are born in families that are hearing that do not know how to communicate with them. It means that these children have no way to vent. They cannot express, they cannot communicate. They have no one to talk to them. Many of them, when lockdown was eased, asked their parents to come to our office because they wanted to say something. They were yearning to communicate. The lockdown created a lot of mental, mental deprivation amongst children with disabilities, especially deaf children. These feelings of language deprivation, you can imagine, drove many of these children to a point of insanity. After lockdown, we had to sit down with a lot of deaf people who kept coming into our office, 
in need of psychological counseling. The deep yearning to communicate is very human to all of us. It's a human right. One of the boys who is deaf and was a student at Wachiso Secondary School for the Deaf lives in Mitiana. He told us of his story. He walked 67 kilometers from Mitiana to Gomba during lockdown to look for one of his colleagues. He was holding a picture, a photograph that he had kept from school. He walked 67 kilometers to look for someone who could understand him, with whom he could communicate. Livelihoods and sources of income. We realize that the majority of persons with disabilities are unemployed. That's a fact. They rely on others for their sustenance. This lockdown created over-dependency. And when someone is over-dependent on you, as a human being, you vent out your frustration. The first thing to do, the feelings of frustration being so immense and tense, is violence. And violence, although is not the answer to some of these constraints and some of these tensions, is an easy way for many people to vent their anger. Many people who are disabled live their lives on, from hand to mouth. Those who are in employment, who are in the minority, many of them live on meager savings. And during lockdown, and even right now to this time, many are struggling to survive. Farmers in rural areas who are undertaking their daily activities trading in local markets, as we know. When these markets were closed because of burning in gatherings, they lost their income. Post lockdown, our, our country came to an easing of lockdown. Transport was hiked. Many people could not afford. So this created a lot of problems for persons with disabilities. Education. This must be remembered as the worst year in the history of education in Uganda. For many disabled children are from poor families struggling to survive. The unique learning needs of children with disabilities have not at all been addressed by the Minister of Health. Being out of school for such a long period of time has had detrimental effects on the mental, psychological, social welfare of children with disabilities. And then the outcome, the issue of social media and multimedia, although it's a very good way to learn, a good learning tool, it is inaccessible for most children with disabilities. Imagine online lessons, lessons via television, radio, none of this. Radio cannot be heard by the deaf. Television, what about the blind? And so many other types of disabilities. This meant that a lot of children with disabilities who were in school at that time lost interest. Many forgot that they ever learned anything. So it would be very difficult for them to return to school come the new year. It will also be very difficult for parents of these children, many of them, to see the value of educating that disabled child when they are already struggling with the effects of economic, the, the effects of economic um, issues due to the pandemic. What did DevLink Uganda do? When we realized all these problems, we decided to investigate. We started our own coronavirus intervention and we called all the people together we provided them with the tools that they need to help revive their economic activities. For children who are deaf, we started sign language lessons within their homes so that they could start at least communicating with their parents and vice versa. We have made efforts, but these efforts are a drop in the ocean according to the needs of children with disabilities. We must get together as a fraternity, as a nation that cares for one another to respond meaningfully 
And even if we say that Uganda is signatory to the agenda <laughs> social development goal, leave no one behind, this has no meaning whatsoever because we have left a significant special minority of people behind. We have not been truthful. We have abused the rights of a very special population. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I would like us in this discourse, because a lot of times when we sit and discuss, things remain on the table. Action is very slow. I hope that this forum gives us an opportunity to interact meaningfully with one another, to share our experiences. We have a vast lot. We have the resources to do something, to change this issue. And I also want to say before I leave that I realize that a lot of donor agencies who are also referred to as our partners are mostly inclined to support programs within the government. Many donor agencies neglect giving some attention to grassroots organizations like ours. So I would like to appeal for a change in direction, the consideration of those organizations that are right there working directly with the people. These are key to ensuring that everyone in this fight, in this situation of injustice, will come on board together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your great contribution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Midst the COVID-19 pandemic and the government of Uganda's interventions in addressing issues of vulnerable groups. The Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development is the principal government of Uganda ministry in charge of handling vulnerable issues at the most highest strategic level. Therefore, we couldn't have got any other expert than Mr. James Ebitu to talk about this matter. You are most welcome. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. The acting chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission the Ambassador of Sweden in Uganda, country representative of UN Human Rights, colleagues, panelists, distinguished audience and participants on the various media, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Ministry of Gender, in, and indeed on my own behalf, I would like to express our great pleasure an appreciation for the invitation extended to us to be part of this dialogue. It's a very important one uh, in our considerations. Ladies and gentlemen, the year 2020 will be remembered most for the rude shock the world has experienced in the hands of COVID-19 pandemic. The effects of the pandemic have been felt in all sectors of the economy and sections of the population across the world, albeit to different uh, degrees. The magnitude of the effects highly depends on the level of vulnerability of the population and economy as defined by their capacity to cope with the shock. In Uganda, the effects and impact of COVID-19 dates back to March 2020, when the country went into a lockdown. Some of the effects were intact, instant, while others have been gradual. As is expected, the most affected in the face of the shock are the vulnerable to that particular shock. In the case of Uganda, the most vulnerable, and by implication the most affected by COVID-19, were persons in the following categories the informal sector workers, the urban poor, 
Persons with disabilities, as already mentioned, the older persons, the weak and the sick, children, women and girls, as well as refugees, to mention a few. The notable effects on the vulnerable registered are in the form of loss of employment, loss of incomes, inadequate food and nutrition, domestic violence, including sexual and gender-based violence and violence against children, and limited access to essential services, including health, water and sanitation, and education. A number of rapid assessment studies on the impact of COVID have been undertaken in the past six months. And all this revealed that the level of employment uh, went down. The formal and informal uh, sector have experienced a number of layoffs and job cuts as a result of COVID-19. The informal sector workers and social laborers, that is the casual laborers, were most hard hit as up to 60% of our small and micro enterprises were affected. It is important to note at this point that 98.4% of the highly vulnerable households are engaged in the informal sector in this country. In the area of incomes and poverty, ladies and gentlemen, the national poverty is projected to rise by over two percentage points. The middle class is projected to reduce by 5.2 percentage points the increase in unemployment and loss of incomes is projected to lead to increase in poverty among especially the wage earners and casual laborers by 15.7 percentage points. Meanwhile, already 3.1 million persons have fallen below the poverty line in the year 2020 due to COVID-19. This is in accordance with the International Growth Center uh, Report 2020. The national economy growth uh, for this financial year is estimated at 2.9 percent. This is less than half of the 6.8 percent growth rate which was registered in the last financial year. Increase in gender-based violence. This has already been hinted to, ladies and gentlemen. During this time, we noted that 86 percent of the survivors of gender-based violence were women and girls. According to the Uganda Police Force Criminal Investigations Directory Report, a total of 16,242 cases of gender-based violence were reported in the period January to June 2020 alone. Of these, 46.8 percent were cases of domestic violence, and this included issues like failure to provide for the family, infidelity, and, and drug and alcohol abuse. 43.2 percent of these cases were of defilement. 5.6% were cases of rape. And up to 161 cases went to the level of murder, so lives were lost. The other issue that we experienced as the effect of COVID was social exclusion and anxiety among the vulnerable persons. Many of the extremely vulnerable persons, including frail older persons, persons with extreme uh, disabilities, as already highlighted by our sister Nasozi, and the critically ill face challenges of inadequate access to information, inadequate access to essential services, as well as stigmatization, especially in the case of those infected by COVID-19. As a response strategy to the COVID-19 shock, government with support from the non-state actors, including our development partners, some of whom are present here, employed a two-pronged approach, namely using the existing social protection interventions and applying one of emergency support initiatives to address the immediate needs of the most affected persons to enable them cope with and manage the socioeconomic effects of COVID-19. One of the emergency interventions was the distribution of food, especially to the urban poor within the Kampala metropolitan area. Up to 1.4 million vulnerable persons received food support and other related items. In the area of existing government programs on social protection, ladies and gentlemen would like to mention here that uh, we have a program for the older persons, which is called the Special Assistance Grant for Empowerment, commonly referred to as SAGE. These grants were rolled out across the country. 
At the time, COVID set in, we had not yet covered 61 districts. But as we speak now, the program was rolled out to cover all the districts in this country, up to 146 districts. And during this period, we were able to reach out 307,000 older persons. And these are mainly older persons uh, within the age bracket above 80 years. They are now on the monthly payroll under this program. We also have special grants for persons with disabilities. And uh, during this period, the allocation was scaled up from 2.1 billion to 5 billion for this financial year. Under this, a total of 2,046 persons with disabilities have been supported to date, and we expect additional 6,000 persons with disabilities to receive support within the next six months. We also have the labor-intensive public works, and this is ideally a cash-for-work program under the office of the Prime Minister. This has continued to be implemented in the areas of northern Uganda, and we have 136 persons benefiting from this program. Other programs include the Kampala City Girls Empower Girls Project, targeting 1,500 girls. This is ongoing. We also have Child Sensitive Social Protection Project in the refugee hosting areas in the West Nile sub-region. Uh, this is ongoing, uh, courtesy of support from SIDA through the World Food Program. Other library programs that you know of in this country, the Youth Library, the Women Program, MYOGA, Operations Wealth Creation, are ongoing. As a new development, government also has designed an urban cash for work program. And this is soon to be launched, and this will be covering the main urban centers in this country. There are, of course, other inter interventions. For instance, in Bank of Uganda, they lowered the lending rate from 9% to 8% in April 2020, and this was in a bid to ensure adequate access to credit and promote the normal functioning of the financial markets. In the area of domestic violence, where we had a number of challenges, as already stated above, the ministry reactivated the 16 gender-based shelters uh, distributed across the country to temporarily host the survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. We also continue to maintain the operations of our child reception center, as well as the remand homes across the country. We've maintained phone call and online reporting and response through our line in Kireka called Sauti 116. And the, indeed, most of these cases we're talking about were reported and responded to through that line. We continue in media engagements to sensitize the public on the dangers of gender-based violence, violence against children, and encourage survivors to seek support from these existing services. We have learned a number of lessons during this time. One, we need a very strong a comprehensive social protection system to improve the capacity of the vulnerable persons to cope with the socioeconomic effects occasioned by the various shocks. All the existing social protection programs that I've already outlined some of should be made shock responsive. The experience that we have heard of the senior assistance grant, the SAGE program, was that it was tailored to move at a certain rate and the processes would rather take long to cover all the 61 districts. But in the face of COVID, we devised other mechanisms and made quick adjustments to move faster and accommodate more people within a short time. We noted that we need to have increased investment in system strengthening. Our sister here has mentioned, when you talk about persons with disabilities, the deaf and so on, do we exactly know where they are? How many are they? So the power of information and evidence must be really uh, tapped on so that we are able to respond accordingly. Once these figures are known, it's easier to plan. And I want to encourage uh, the stakeholders who are here that uh, much of this effort is a shared responsibility. And I think once we continue working together as a team, uh, all will be better. Not that we shall have 100% perfection, but we shall try as much as possible to be as close to perfect as possible. Now, Uganda has developed a single registry for social protection, and this is due to be launched uh, by end of this month. And this social registry will try to put together and work as a repository of data for the various categories of vulnerable people in this country. This single registry has been supported uh, by the World Bank and the DFID, 
uh, that is the UK aid as it was uh, previously. So we are here and we think if we all tap into this, we should be able to have uh, useful data for our programming purposes. I want to mention that during the time of COVID, I happened to be the acting permanent secretary of Minister of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. And the categories that I interacted with the most included persons with disabilities. They made a number of appeals. And uh, through the collaboration and cooperation that we had with them and other stakeholders, we were able to initiate some actions. I will give you a quick example, and indeed to confirm what our sisters just said here. When we were conveying these messages, daily briefs on COVID on, at the media center, there was no interpreter for the deaf at all. So they raised issues to my office. By then, I was the only one seated in the office. The rest were at home. So I contacted the authorities there, and that's when an interpreter was put in there. Issues were raised about studying from home. Through, again, uh, the organizations working for persons with the deaf. And I quickly contacted the Minister of Education. As we talk now, some of the materials are in the brain. But like she said, the issues of persons with disabilities are very complex. Providing braille does not address the matter of the person, the deaf persons. So you have to look at this comprehensively. And I want to encourage our stakeholders that the ministry, which is your reference point, is the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. You can contact others, but make sure your own ministry is informed to push even further for you. I want to encourage you, if you have not yet done so, to get to us so that this useful information that you have is available with us. Not that we are promising that things will be sorted out, but together we shall make it. In conclusion, the call for social protection is not only based on human rights or moral grounds, but on the belief and evidence that's an important instrument for sustainable economic growth, poverty and vulnerability reduction, as well as social inclusion. Uganda, as we stand today, is in the right path of and has made significant progress in developing her social protection system. We recognize it is still young and it's developing, but we're in the right direction and we think a lot more can still be achieved. There's need for continuous building on the gains to ensure a more robust social protection system that fosters inclusive and faster socioeconomic transformation in line with the Uganda Vision 2040 and the NDP 3 as we implement it. I want to thank all the stakeholders here for the support that you continue to give to the ministry. And um, at this point, I encourage you to continue raising the red flags. Continue raising the red flags where you see them to ensure that the right things are done. The U Uganda Human Rights Commission has done this to us, and to some extent we have responded. And I want to encourage everybody that together we shall make it. This is your ministry. Do not fear to criticize. Bring positive criticisms, and we shall continue to work. Resources are limited. We know social protection is not cheap. But within the resources we have, government is uh, uh, committed to making sure we deliver. This is also reflected in our National Development Plan 3, and that's an opportunity that we should tap in. I thank you all for your very kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. B. A B2, and for keeping time. I was about to remind you to conclude. You said in the conclusion. So <laughs> I was uh, pleased with the, the way you handled uh, the time. Ladies and gentlemen, we had expected a presentation from the Minister of Health, but unfortunately, uh, for reasons beyond their control, they've not been able to make it. That being said, it is now a chance for us to make our contributions from the plenary, um, sorry, from the audience, uh, if there is any question, any comment, recommendation, we have 15 minutes to do that. I request that you put up your hand and then you uh, raise the issue you would like to raise. The floor is open. 
uh, the, there is a hand here and uh, everything is being done here and uh, uh, in a way I didn't expect. I was about to say in our midst we have Mr. John Oraj, a member of the National Council for Older Persons representing the civil society organization. He's also the chairperson the, uh, of the National Network for Older Persons of Uganda. But in point to say that, uh, he, he raises his hand up and he would like to make a contribution. You are most welcome. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, just for the sake of time, I want to make a few brief observations. I'll, I'll start that it's really an honor for us as older persons to be invited to participate in a discussion like this. Because in Uganda, we the older persons are the forgotten species. We were left behind. We are just now trying to find our feet. Although in African society, an older person is supposed to be the leader. Because without the older persons, there are no younger generations. But when you look at our democracy here in Uganda, the youth, because they have a strong voice, they are listened to. The women, because of their numbers, they are listened to. The PWDs also are a very strong movement. And here I would like to start with the PWDs. You know, as a person gets older, as you age, the systems degenerate. And some diseases start coming in. Yesterday was the International Day for People with Disabilities. Among the issues raised was the, the, the national policy and the law for the disability. Uh, our first presenter actually talked about categories of disability. But in those, those, those uh, documents that were presented, there is no category of disabilities that is occasioned by age. For instance, when you age, you start to lose your sight, you start to lose your hearing, the ability to move, cognitive processes, the ability to think and to remember things. But within the disability movement, that one is not included. And Madam Nasozi there talked about a deaf person will not hear the things going on around. But a person who has been very normal in early life, because of his age, begins to lose his hearing. And people don't pay attention to this person, that the person has actually lost the hearing. But it is not in included in the disability, uh, the categories of disability. So that is one thing. When uh, they are talking of the disability, I'm glad Mr. Bitu is also here as the director of social protection. They should consider that as you age, degeneration takes place. And the disability is caused by age, but they are not recognized in the act or in the policy. The other issue I wanted to raise was the COVID pandemic. You know, the information that came was that this pandemic has come for the older persons. It's actually targeting the older persons. And for us older people, we knew if you go to a hospital, that's where you are going to catch it. And once you catch, you, you catch it, that's the end of you because it is targeting you. So the information that was put out by the COVID people did not actually correct that misconception. So a lot of older persons who need, who already have underlying health conditions and need to regularly attend to medi medical facilities, don't go to those facilities because they are afraid of catching COVID already in a bad situation of health. So that's an issue that needs to be addressed. Now the, 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 the last comment I would like to make very quickly is Mr. Ibitu who has just spoken very nicely about senior citizens grant. 
which has been rolled out to the whole country. But we realize that at the age of 80 years and above, in a country where our life expectancy is actually 64, but you're looking at 80 and above, how many people are 80 years and above in this country? Then secondly, what is there for the majority of older persons who are between 60 and 79, who are not catered for by any other scheme for their livelihood. Considering that they have no access to credit because in this country, once you're 65, financial institutions consider you a risky borrower. You cannot even be insured. You're in the wrong age bracket. And yet there is nothing to cater for you. So those are issues I would like us to ponder. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was the chairperson of all the persons, and I hesitated to disrupt him. The next intervention should kindly last for no more than two minutes. Uh, Mr. Robert Kochane, Office of the High Commissioner, Uganda. Thank you so much, and once again, congratulations to the organizers of this event. Uh, we are all uh, in agreement that both civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights have been affected by, by this pandemic. And uh, consequently, the response to COVID-19 must have uh, human rights at its heart. As said, uh, the UN Secretary General uh, echoed on in that by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. The High Commissioner for Human Rights has uh, expressly requested globally all field presences to have uh, a strong bearing on economic, social, and cultural rights into the 2021 annual uh, work plan, meaning that uh, my office in Uganda, in collaboration with all relevant actors, will escalate efforts in uh, promoting and protecting uh, economic, social, and cultural rights uh, in the coming months. With that, the, this uh, um, forum also gives me the opportunity to plead for our government to continue allocating the necessary resources to the relevant institutions. But I put uh, a, a particular emphasis on institutions such as the Equal Opportunities Commission, the Uganda Human Rights Commission, and uh, the, National Commission on Dis the National Commission on Disability, so that they can continue uh, doing the, the performing their mandate uh, and uh, ensure that uh, efforts are made to leave no one behind particularly in the context of the COVID-19. Uh, we, we understand that there might be possibility of a vaccine, but uh, that's a long process, and uh, we should really continue and escalate effort in our prevention and protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is a lady uh, at the back. On my right was the first 